This is the Weepy Voiced Killer. It's two hours into the new year, January 1st, 1981, when police in St. Paul, Minnesota get a call about a girl near the railroad tracks who was hurt and needs help. She's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks. What's the address? I don't know. Who are you? The police try to get more information out of the caller, but they don't offer much more info besides the location and to hurry. The police respond to the call and find Karen Potak, who's barely alive, and they rush her to the hospital. Karen survives, but has no memory of her attack. No physical evidence is found at the scene, and it seems like no witness either, so the police department has no direction to go in, and the case goes cold. The one remarkable thing they remember about the case is the odd, weepy voice of the caller on the other end of the line that sent shivers down their spines. Don't know why I had this camera. I'm so upset about it. A few months later in Minneapolis, the police get a call from a guy with a strange, crying, high-pitched voice. And he says, You find me, I just stabbed somebody with a knife stick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Is this guy for real? He gives an address again, and they find the body of 18-year-old student Kimberly Compton. When police get there, they realize that the person who they spoke to on the phone is exactly the person that he says he is. Police didn't release the details of the autopsy or the weapon used to the public. So when the caller specifically mentioned an ice pick to them, they knew that he was for real. After this, police officially named their sobbing suspect the Weepy Voiced Killer, which is sometimes shortened to WVK in articles, which I'm going to shorten even further to the Dub VK. He calls back again two days later saying he's sorry, that he doesn't know why he does these things, and that he'll try not to do it to anyone else. But this time, he stays on the phone long enough for the cops to be able to trace the call. Hell yes! They track down the call to a bus depot phone booth, but by the time the cops get there, the blubbering boogeyman is gone. Hell no! The police release the audio from the 911 call and ask if anyone recognizes the voice. Of course the residents of Minneapolis go absolutely bonkers. Here was this creepy, terrifying voice of some monster that was lurking in the shadows, and no one knew who he would strike next. The release of the audio also meant that everyone and their mother thought they knew someone who sounded like the unknown caller. And over 100 names were given to the police, but not a single person is suspected from them. With no evidence and no witnesses, once again, the case goes cold, and the city grows more paranoid. Five months after the news segment, the police answer the phone to a familiar sounding voice. The voice claims that they are responsible for what happened to Barbara Simmons, a 40-year-old nurse who would soon be found caught in the underbrush by the Mississippi River. He also mentions that he is responsible for Kimberly. He even goes so far as to call back three days later to correct some of the details that the reporters got wrong about Kimberly's case in the papers that day. This is approaching serial territory. This guy is organized, and he's hella clean with evidence. So the police trace Barbara's final moments to a bar called the Hexagon Bar, and they're able to talk to a waitress who saw Barbara dancing with some unknown guy. They show the waitress over a hundred photos of mugshots before she stops them on one man in particular, and is like, that's him. She points out a 37-year-old man named Paul Michael Stephanie. And the police were like, that's bananas. Police immediately arrange for a surveillance team to follow and monitor his apartment. But on August 21st, he leaves his apartment from Minneapolis and the cops lose him. How do you lose a car? That's a big thing to lose. Soon after this, a 19-year-old escort named Denise Williams is working in the red light district of Minneapolis. A man pulls up to Denise and offers her a price for a fun night in his apartment and she agrees and gets in the car with him. It's over very quickly, which is odd to Denise at the time. And the man offers to drive her back to the corner he picked her up on, and she agrees. On the way back to the district, however, the man starts taking the back roads and tells Denise he's taking a shortcut. But of course, Denise, who knows the area well, observes that they're heading in the wrong direction, and she begins to panic. 
Denise discreetly looks around on the floor for a weapon she could use if the man tries to do anything to her and she spots a bottle on the floor of the dirty stained carpet. She makes up her mind that if this guy tries anything, she'll break the bottle over his head and hopefully stun him enough to get away. Because Denise is a bad The man pulls into this dark, empty parking lot without any street lighting and makes a suggestive comment at Denise, saying that no one rides for free. Denise tries to hop out of the car, but the man grabs her and begins attacking her with a screwdriver. Denise attempts her plan of breaking the glass bottle over his head, and it works. It shatters over his head, causing him deep cuts to his face and head, but he keeps going after her. She's able to finally get the car door open. So she tumbles out, but the man jumps out after her, throws himself on top of her, and a struggle ensues. So this guy is viciously attacking her, and at first she's fighting back and kicking and screaming with all her might. But once she realizes that this guy is too powerful for her, she stops fighting altogether and tries to go limp to get him to think he'd finished her off. But this time, it doesn't work. This man is relentless. When Denise cries out in pain, a man in a nearby apartment hears her, so he runs over and pulls the attacker off of her. The psycho with the screwdriver swings his weapon at the man and chases him back to his apartment. The man is able to get in his apartment and shut the door so he could call the police, and the attacker jumps back in his car and flees the scene. The Good Samaritan runs back outside to help Denise once he's sure the man is gone, and she's rushed to the hospital where she receives life-saving surgery for her puncture wounds. That same night, the Minneapolis Police Department phone begins to ring. On the phone, the soft, blubbering voice cries to them that he needs an ambulance, that he's all cut up, and then he gives them his address. The ambulance and police pull up to the residence and knock on the door. And who answers the door but none other than the same face that was picked out in the mugshot by the waitress, Paul Michael Stefani. They arrest him, and Denise easily picks him out from his mugshot as her attacker. And finally, nearly two years after Karen's attack by the railroad tracks, the weepy-voiced has a face. As investigators begin to dig into this man's past, suddenly a lot of things about him are beginning to make sense. Paul Stefani grew up in a deeply religious home and had a history of psychiatric problems, along with a previous assault charge, hence why his mugshot is available to the police. Paul lived by himself and worked as a janitor. At one point, he worked at the factory next to the railroad tracks, which is where he attacked Karen. Investigators show the crime scene photos from the various attacks to Paul, who looks at the photos for a second, then asks the investigators, you're not gonna pin those on me. The man's voice suddenly gets high-pitched as he begins to panic, and the detectives instantly recognize the voice that had been taunting them for nearly two years, and they know they've got their guy. Paul continues to deny having any involvement with the women, and denies being the caller with the weepy voice. He claims that he was a victim of a robbery, and that this was all a mistake. Because Paul's crimes are committed in different counties, the legal proceedings get a little complicated, so he first stands trial for Barbara and Denise in Minneapolis. Of course, Paul pleads not guilty, and the prosecution's entire plan of attack is attempting to match the voice to Paul. They play the phone recordings of the calls about Barbara and the one they get after Denise's attack for the courtroom. Then they play an audio recording of Paul's voice during his interrogation, immediately after his arrest, in an attempt to match the voice. Voice experts testify that while the voices are remarkably similar, they can't conclusively say if the voices are an exact match or not. Enter Paul's sister. She listens to the 911 call, bows her head, and says she knows without a doubt that the voice on the phone is her brother. The trials last six weeks, and Paul Stefani is found guilty for taking the life of Barbara and is sentenced to 40 years in prison. Stefani also pleads not guilty to the attack on Denise, but he's convicted again and is sentenced to 18 more years. Despite the fact that Paul is found guilty for the attacks on the two women in Minneapolis, the jurisdiction of St. Paul, where Paul is supposed to be tried for the attacks on Karen and Kimberly, didn't believe they would have enough evidence to convict him. 
The prosecutors believe that voice evidence wouldn't be enough to convict someone, so they elect to leave the cases of the two women unsolved, robbing the families of both women of any possible closure. Fast forward to 1997. It's 12 years later, and Paul calls up his local police from prison. He's just been diagnosed with terminal melanoma, and he wants to come clean and confess to the two other attacks in St. Paul that he was never formally charged for. So the St. Paul police schlep over to his cell to conduct an interview, and Paul officially confesses to the attacks on Karen and Kimberly. Then he confesses to a case that police hadn't ever been able to solve, the drowning of Kathleen Greening in her own Roseville apartment in July of 1982. Unbeknownst to everyone, Paul claims another life just weeks before his fourth victim, Barbara. Detectives pull Kathleen's file from the cold case section and go back over it, and they find this address book they'd taken from her home as evidence. They flip through the pages until they find a contact with the name Paul S. Next to that name, they see Paul Stefani's phone number. And finally, for Karen Potak, Kimberly Compton, and now Kathleen Greening, some sort of justice has been done. The judge who convicts Paul in Barbara's trial says he doesn't believe that Paul enjoys or relishes in what he did. The judge believes that Paul feels guilty for what he did and makes the 911 phone calls because he just can't stop himself. Paul explains to doctors that taking life was just as natural as giving life to someone or eating food. In 1998, Paul Michael Stefani passed away from melanoma at the age of 53 while serving out his 58-year prison sentence. But was Paul born this way? Does he really have these innate primal urges that he just has to act on? And is he really telling the truth in his calls when he says he wants to stop but can't? Or are the calls just a product of a sick and twisted mind from someone who's proud of what they did and wants to taunt the police about it? When the police realize that their dub VK is a serial K, they call up the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit to profile their suspect. Profiler Kimberly Masnick theorizes that during the calls, the killer is regressing back to a childlike state and that he really is crying out for help. But she also says that the calls also tell her that Paul is someone who loves a good game of cat and mouse. Psychologists believe that because Paul grows up in a strictly religious Catholic household, it creates this guilty conscience for him. And this is what forces him to make the phone calls. Just as a priest in a confessional booth would absolve him of his sins as a kid, Paul uses his 911 calls as a way to absolve himself from his crimes. This is further proven by the phone call Paul makes after he slays Kimberly when he screams that he'll never make it to heaven. Paul also claims that his stepfather was quite violent, and it wasn't uncommon for him to smack one of the kids over the head and for them to go flying down the stairs. Experts believe the instigator for Paul's crime spree came when his wife divorced and moved out, taking their daughter along with her. Around that same time, he lost his manufacturing job, and well, you know the rest. And that about does it for the terrifying tale of the weepy voiced killer. The dub BK sticks out to me a lot because of the fact that experts believe he still had a conscience and felt remorse. He just seems like such a rare breed of predator. <laughs>